Welcome to A Double, Double, and Dice, with your host Kim, and Jocelyn. Pour your favorite beverage, pull up a comfy chair, because we are ready to roll. Welcome to episode 49 of A Double, Double, and Dice, and today we're going to continue on our series of female characters and Dice Masters, but before we get to that, we're going to dive into a pretty heavy dice bag. There's been a lot of chatter, Kim. There has been, because our last episode was crazy. Spoilers! (laughs) All the spoilers, well, four spoilers anyway, uh, including a confirmation of a new super rare that we didn't know existed yet, um, and some pretty spicy cards as well. Um, There was a lot of conversation about some of those cards on the podcast, uh, after the podcast, and we did hear back from our uh, contacts at WizKids to confirm um, how how certain cards may work. So, uh, based on what we had talked about in in the podcast, right, Kim? Yes. Cool. So, if you haven't listened to it, go take a listen. <laughs> yeah. Um, should we maybe start with the Wiz Kids conversation? Sure. So, um, the one thing that we talked a lot about in the episode was the Emma Frost and Emma Frost manipulative is a five cost shield. She is the uncommon that we spoiled, and her text reads, When Emma Frost is active, at the start of your opponent's attack step, re-roll target character die they control. And we were talking in the podcast in the podcast episode about would that trigger before or after your opponent declares attackers. So Kim and I were a little divided on that in the middle, but we think we came to a consensus at the end, and it turned out that our consensus was correct. So um, this would preempt your opponent declaring attackers and doing um, any when attacks abilities, such as hashtag grow Spider Man forever or anything else that declares when attacks range, breath weapon, all of those things. So Emma would actually preempt that. So basically, your opponent would trigger an attack step. If you have Emma active, you would get to target a character die to reroll it. Mm -hmm. And then the attack step would continue as normal. Yeah. And I think that's the consensus we came to at the end of the episode. But we do have the confirmation from WizKids that that is how it is intended to work, um, which is basically exactly as written. So part of what we got in the dice bag was a question from, I believe it was Nick. Was it Nick, Kim? Jackalope spam? From Discord? Yes. Yeah. And his question was, what if you were only planning to attack with X character die, say rare Spider-Man forever, and your opponent's Emma re-rolled it and it re-rolled back to an energy phase. And you didn't want to attack with anything else or you didn't have anything else to attack with. What would happen then? So we did not get an official WizKiz answer on this question, but my personal opinion is the attack step has been triggered. So if you have a legal attacker, I feel like you would have to attack with it, even if it wasn't the one you were intending to attack with. And if there is no legal attacker, one of two things would happen. Um, Either the attack step would fizzle because it hasn't actually started yet, or um, you would continue on the attack step except there'd be no attackers or blockers to declare and you move into globals. So what do you think, Kim? So if you only have one character, you declare an attack step. Uh huh. I re-roll out your Spider-Man, because we're using Spider-Man. I would assume it finishes off the attack step. It finishes off as in there's a global window? Or... As a global window. Yeah. Yeah, I think Because you're already so. in the attack step, and all that stuff's happening in the attack step. Yeah, and if that is the case, using logic, then... If you have a different legal attacker, I feel like you would have to attack with that that die. I don't know if you would have to. You have declared an attack step. You have a legal attacker. Yeah, but before you you declared it, then Emma named Spider Man, mm-hmm. and then you go to attack with Spider Man, but now he has to get rolled. Well, you don't get to attack with Spider Man. Right, he gets rolled. He gets rolled before um, the attack is declared. And then that's it. If you even if you had another attacker, you didn't declare it as attacking. So, but you haven't declared anything as attacking with Emma. It's literally at the start of the step before you declare attackers. So I guess you could attack with it if you wanted to. So, 
So yeah, so that is a good question. Um, I don't have an answer for you, but we will see if we can find out. Um, but that that's how I would see it, and I would love to hear how other people would see it. So let's say you have two dice active, you go to attack, your, the day you wanted to attack with is re-rolled. Do you have to attack with the other? What do you think, listeners? Let us know. Let us know what you think. So, um, so yeah, so that was where most of the conversation came around, was around the Emma. Um, because that ability is something brand new and it doesn't, it doesn't exist yet, right? It's really exciting. Uh, so we also heard from Jason Lucero on the YouTube and he asked the question, does the attack step begin when a player actually declares their attackers or is it entered into regardless? Um, and uh, we went back to Jason and let him know that, you know, per the rule book, the attack step does not occur if the player does not choose to attack. Mm -hmm. So from the X-Men Forever rule book, it reads the active player now chooses if they want to attack or not. If the active player does not wish to attack, the turn will immediately end. There will not be an attack step, which means unused action dice will go immediately to the use pile, and neither player will be able to use any energy on global abilities. Go directly to step five, the cleanup step. So, so yeah, so it's it's interesting, um, and I think that's where it's important that you um, pair Emma with something that's going to make your opponent have to attack, if that's the case. Whether that is something like um, Toad from the X-Men Forever campaign box that says that you field him and name an affiliation and your opponent must attack with all dice of that affiliation. Or a force block, or sorry, a force attack global <laughs> like the one on Slingers, right? Or Black Widow. There's there's a force attack uh, global Kate, on that. Kate Bishop. Kate Bishop. Oh, no, no. That's no. the one that's no longer attacking. No, no, no. Yeah. No, that, that one's a, the static field global. Yeah, yeah. It's no longer attacking. It's uh, Black Widow. It's There's one on one of the WWE guys as well. Mm. Um, I can't remember which one. Yeah. Anyway, so there are some globals that say target character die must attack this turn. So that would be a good pair up with um, with Emma Frost. So. so, yeah, so I'd say most of the conversation really came about Emma, didn't it? Yeah, it's going to be an interesting card. Mm hmm So... It was uh, it was exciting. It's going to be interesting. It's an uncommon, so knock on wood, it should be pretty easy to get for people. Yeah. And I think you're going to see a lot of it. Um, and what we also did, in addition to the podcast, was we put out a article that went along with the podcast uh, a few hours after the podcast came out. So you can go over to dm-north.com and check out the article post where you can actually read the thoughts of all of the DM North TV members about these cards what we think and what we think they're going to do uh, in um, drafting and meta and all those types of things so really great conversation there from our colleagues Jordo, ccm quadruple seven reg and um gord i can't remember his name gord now. i was trying to go i know his name is gord but i was oh. trying to go with his like online name gord <laughs> He has an online name. I don't know his online name. I can't remember it and I feel horrible. I'm going to look it up. While I'm looking it up, Kim, what did what else did you think about that, Emma? Was she she you were excited about that one. Yeah, I I um I think it's going to stop a lot of things. Um yeah. people might not want to attack which is fine, but the only problem is it won't re it won't roll out a God Catcher token, unfortunately. No, you it can't won't roll. You can't roll tokens. But son of L, um, ah, there it is. <laughs> I I can't believe I forgot that. I'm sorry, Gord slash son of L. Um. So yeah. So that was where uh, all of our thoughts are. Okay, so what else did we hear? We heard from DM Armada. He listened to us on the YouTube as well, and he said some cool stuff in there, looking forward to the set. And he also confirmed that there was no attack step if a player doesn't choose to attack, similar to what I had said to Jason in that conversation. So mm -hmm. um, so that was good to see. Uh, who else did we hear from? Craig. We heard from Craig. We heard from Craig in two places. Mm -hmm. So Craig replied to the article that supported the podcast 
And he said, thank you for another great show and supporting article was very interesting to see the various opinions on those spoilers. I hope WizKid sees that a very high bar has been set for how to do a spoil properly. I, for one, if they would ever listen to me, which will never happen, <laughs> would like to get all future spoils from a double double in dice. It just seems like good business to have that single source of great spoils that the market can rely on. So that was super nice to hear. And uh, certainly Craig always says nice, lovely things about us. And then also on the Dice Masters Unlimited Facebook page, someone had shared a tweet that WizKids had put out with a uh, spoiler draft pack saying, you know, what would your draft pick be? And it went up and then it went down. It came down. And uh, Craig replied to that and said, dear WizKids, <laughs> could you please put a double double in dice in charge of all future spoilers? I would trust that they can avoid any type of um, teases like this in the future. Where I wonder it why it went down. down. Well, my th my speculation after some conversation back and forth, I thought initially that it had to do with the fact that there were two basic action cards there that had not been spoiled yet. Um, but I was going back and forth with Nick on Facebook there, and he said that this spoiler image had previously be, been used, but the rogue card has had an art change oh so if you remember a while ago we heard that there we saw a new spoiler of rogue and it had a different um different art on it and there was a bunch of conversation about that and that the original art that had been selected was from an artist who had had a falling out with marvel mm. and was no longer working with marvel so there was speculation in the community there's nothing official of course but there was speculation from people in the community that the um, the that was one of the reasons the set was delayed was because they had to redo the art for that rogue because perhaps they weren't working with that artist anymore. Gotcha. Um, of course, we have no official confirmation of that, but that was the reason why Nick thought that the spoilers had maybe been taken down because it had the old art on it because mm. it was an older picture. So um, I could see that, and and I'm sort of on board with that interpretation over the basic actions if this spoiler image had been used before they just had to change it because of the fact that they've changed the art on the rogue so again all speculation yeah nothing officials <laughs> so um so yeah so anyway there was also a whole bunch of chatter on our discord channel dm north tv if you're not a member we'll drop a link in the show notes and you can join us there we have a double double in pod a double double and dice podcast <laughs> chat channel oh my gosh so many words and there was a lot of conversation about what was happening there as well uh where you can actually use the spoiler bars which is uh always fun on discord so that people who don't want to read spoilers have a chance to wait until they've had a chance to you know watch or read or what have you mm -hmm. so um there was something in here where was it kim oh uh, there was a comment from Red Mage. Oh no, it's Red Mage. And he, uh, he said, speaking of affiliations, Rogue didn't get the Avengers affiliation for the card literally titled for the Avengers Unity Division is weak. <laughs> <laughs> Wish they'd shake up the affiliations and give us the Avengers Wolverine, X-Men Magneto, and the likes. Not to mention Wanda has never been a flipping X-Man, so stop with that affiliation. <laughs> <laughs> so... Does so she have an affiliation, really? Or no? No, she's only been villain, I think. Oh, okay. I mean, you can go look it up if you want. She's been Brotherhood? Yes. I think but I don't think she's been to... an X-Man. No. No. I think Scarlet Witch, right? No. Yeah, yeah Scarlet, Scarlet Witch. Witch. Yeah, yeah, she has been an X-Man. Has right. she been an X-Man? Yeah, that's why he was thinking he, she... Was she... I never knew she was an X-Man. <laughs> yeah, she's definitely an X-Man, but has she been an X-Man in Dice Masters? Well, she's an X-Man affiliated from the Deadpool set. Well, there you go. Red Mage, X-Men affiliated from the Deadpool set. Yep, she's been X-Men, and then she's been Mystics from Doctor Strange set. Right, okay. And then she's been, uh, what's the W? The W? Oh, that's Scarlet Spider, sorry. And then she's been, uh, and then she's been Brotherhood and villains from uh, X Men First Class. Yeah, yeah. So there is a Deadpool, or sorry, there is an X Men affiliated Wanda. So what does that Wanda do? Oh, and there's even a um, Avengers affiliated Wanda. 
Interesting. Wow, there's a lot of Scarlet Witch cards that I didn't even know existed. Yeah, uh, which I'm one? Sure. The X Men one. Yeah. Um. So her common is a when fielded, you may move a target fist character die from an opponent's prep area to their bag. The uncommon is Scarlet Witch costs one less to purchase if an opponent has a fist character or action die in their prep area. They all look like they're fist related. When her rare is when fielded, deal one damage to all players and non fist character dice. And do and two damage to all fist character dice. Yeah, maybe that's why, because it's not really a card that's been played a lot. No, Red Mage yeah, didn't she's got a lot of affiliations. Wow. Uncanny X Men, she was in Avengers and a X Men as well. Yeah, so there you go. So she has been an X Men somewhere. Unless he was saying she hasn't been an X Men in the comics. Well, maybe. Maybe that's what he was saying. I don't know. I'm confused now. Red Mage, let us know what you meant. <laughs> so maybe Scarlet Witch might be one we need to look into. <laughs> Maybe. Well, Get her backstory. Uh, oh my gosh, that. that might take a while. So, um, so yeah. So I think that's sort of the, the main feedback we had from the last episode. We really enjoyed sharing the spoilers with you. We hope that you enjoyed it as well. Like I said, the conversation was quite robust and, and we had a great time. So with that said, Kim, we are continuing our female characters in Dice Master series. Is that right? That is right. And we thought, since we just did these Dark Phoenix spoilers last week, and since we know that Dark Phoenix run the boat, won the boat race and will be <laughs> the first set releasing in 2022, we did something we don't normally do. Right, Kim? That's right. What did we pick? We picked Moira McTaggart. I think that's how you say it. Yeah, so we picked the Moira cards. So yes. there are currently three rarities mm -hmm. of Moira spoiled. Um, I don't know if there is a super rare Moira. I hope there is because I don't know if we yeah, have all the super rare spoilers for that set or not. Um, and we did our searching to pick a character going through the BritRoller6.com webpage where Chris and Andy over at the Ministry of Dice have a fantastic page where it's called uh, uh, Unreleased Set Spoilers. You can click on the sets that haven't released yet and they have a, a great library of these cards. So we took a look at what female characters had been spoiled so far for Dark Phoenix Saga and decided to talk about Moira. So um, Moira is a very interesting comic character because for many years um, she was thought to be just a normal average human. She was just a person, um, just a regular human. She wasn't a mutant. And she was involved with um, Charles Xavier. She was a very smart person because, surprise, she's a scientist. Aren't they all? Um, so far, yeah. I, I'm pretty sure that all of the people that we've talked about have been scientists or doctors or something like now that. Now I'm going to have to wait and see now when you tell this story if she has some kind of, you know, messed up or messed up marriage or something. <laughs> so, see. Well... As you mentioned that, so let, let's talk about Moira McTaggart of the past, and then we'll talk about Moira McTaggart more in the context of, of current day, which I have a little bit more knowledge about. Um, not that I've read the books, but Rob and I have talked about it uh, for various reasons, which I will talk about. So Moira, um, like I said, was just sort of a, a regular human in her early years. Um, she first appeared in Uncanny X-Men number 96 in December of 1975. So she's a little older than me. <laughs> a little. Um, she worked as a geneticist and was an expert in mutant affairs. And she was romantically involved with Charles Xavier, a.k.a. Professor X. Oh. Um, at Isn't one he a point, little bit older? Were... <laughs> well, I, I mean, I would think so. But, uh, um, but anyway, so uh, she was involved with him and they actually became engaged to be married at some point. Um, and she was his fiance. And then she broke off the engagement. So, um, so that happened there. So, um, she was, um, uh, before she became Moira McTaggart, she was Moira Kinross and she's Scottish. And, uh, she was again, as I mentioned, a geneticist, one of the world leading authorities on genetic mutation. She earned a Nobel prize for her work. 
and she was the longest running human associate of the X-Men. Um, they met when they were postgraduates at Oxford University. So she returned to Scotland after breaking their engagement and was married to her old flame, the late politician Joseph McTaggart. Um, and uh, Kim, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Joe proved to be an abusive husband. Oh. Right? <laughs> So she separated from him, and it, the reference here is that she he beat her into a week long coma, um, and it is implied that she was raped by him, leaving her pregnant. Mm. She kept her son's existence a secret, and when Joe refused a divorce, she allowed people to believe that she was widowed. So there you go. She's a scientist. You know how to pick them. <laughs> she had the abusive husbandy thing. She didn't kill him. As far as I know. Nope. So. Well. Um, so. Uh, it says here that Moira began her connection with the X-Men long before the X-Men team formed. She was actually a silent partner in the founding of Xavier's School for Gifted Youngsters, which, as you know, Kim, is in Oshawa. Right? Parkwood Estates. Oh. Yeah. From the films. Um, and she's also the co-creator of Cerebro. Moira assisted Xavier in helping the young Jean Grey recover from the traumatic triggering of her mutant abilities. Um, she was a kind woman. She took to protecting mutants and rescuing them and, and helping them. Um, and a number of people were um, affected or referenced in this article, such as Rain St. Clair, also known as Wolfsbane. Um she attempted tr to treat Professor Xavier's son, a mutant known as Lesion. Um, and then when a traumatized and confused Cable first arrived from the future, uh, he washed up in Scotland and was unable to speak English. It was Moira who stood up for him. So she's, she's definitely been involved in protecting mutants and mm -hmm. researching mutants and trying to help them in her, in her life. So um, lots of, uh, lots of stuff there. Um, you know, with regards to encouraging Professor Xavier to open the school, helping him with the school, helping the, the X-Men when possible. Um, and she did have, a, you know, a, a part to play in the Dark Phoenix Saga comic book storyline, Kim, which I read. Mm. I went and went on to the Marvel Unlimited app and I read all of the Phoenix and Dark Phoenix Saga comments, comics from the 1970s and um comics are very different in 2021 <laughs> than they were in the 1970s i will say that it was a bit of a slog the story itself was really good the core of the story how the story was laid out and told in the comics i found a bit clunky I think comics are just told a little differently now. There's less text and more focus on the art telling the story. Um, sometimes less dialogue. I guess it depends on the comics, but uh, it was a little bit jarring to watch it and or to read it. And the art was a little different than maybe my preferred style. But the core of the story was very good, and and she was involved in that at the very beginning of the Dark Phoenix saga. They sent. Um, some of the X-Men, including Jean Grey, who had been affected by these um, crazy rays of radiation, but had been reborn as, as Phoenix, um, they sent them to Scotland to Muir Island, which is where um, Moira and her husband, um, who was not Joe at that point, uh, partner, who was she with? I can't remember his name. Banshee. Mm. Um, so she was with Banshee. And uh, they were supposed to be, you know, helping them and, and protecting them and hiding them and all that sort of stuff. Um, but, of course, you know, as, as it happens in comics, chaos ensues and evil people come and there's, there's fights and things like that. So. so, yeah, so she was on Muir Island and she was part of that Dark Phoenix saga. Now, in more recent comics, and I'm going to bring this up because the art on the card, and, and thanks to Red Mage for this, it was in the Brit Roller 6 article um, that we'll be referencing later in the episode. The art from the card is from House of X number two, which is a comic book series, more recent comic book series. 
And this is where we learn that Moira McTaggart herself is actually a mutant. So for many years, we thought that she was not a mutant, that she was just a human. She was a smart human. She was a geneticist, all those types of things. Mm -hmm. um, but we learn that in House of X, that Moira is a mutant and her ability is that she um, is reincarnated when she dies. And um, I probably should have spoiler alerted that because it's a more recent comic book story. Sorry, guys, I ruined that. <laughs> um, she has a number of lives and she remembers her previous lives and learns mm -hmm. from them. So I won't get into all of the details, but there is a really great article about this um, on uh, marvel.fandom.com. And we'll make sure to link that in the show notes that talks about her different lives if you'd like to read it. But I have heard that this House of X comic and its partner comic, um, Powers of X or Powers of Ten, House of X, Powers of Ten, um, comic books are really good to read. Rob and I, and I have talked about them. Rob's read them and he shared this whole story about Moira with me in the past. Um, and it's really interesting. And at some at one point I'm going to have to read it because it does sound very, very good. So um, it's a neat comic book. It's a neat concept. And basically what she's trying to do in each of her lives as she becomes reincarnated is prevent something from happening. And she's trying all kinds of different ways for that to happen. So um, very interesting concept, um, this reincarnation. Um, and because the art on the card is from House of X, and when we start looking at the abilities they may be a little bit more related to the house of x storyline than the dark phoenix storyline um so that's just something to to keep in mind and yeah, when, when i um <clears throat> first uh when we, when we picked her in and you said when i was reading and she was reincarnates every time she dies <laughs> i was like oh her card must have regenerate but we'll find out <laughs> yeah so um She's currently known in the comics as Moira X or Moira, Moira 10. I don't know if they call her Moira X or Moira 10. Uh, but one of the reasons that Rob and I talked about this a lot is because there was a very recent hero click set uh, called House of X. Or as we affectionately called it, or as I affectionately called it in um, in our hero clicks videos, the House of X 10. Is X. <laughs> it's 10 in the Roman numerals. And oh, you know, Jocelyn. <laughs> Well, the comic books are called House of X yeah. and Powers of Ten, but the Ten is an X. Okay. Because it's the Roman numeral for X. So there's actually a Moira X character in the Heroclix set, which is super cool. And I would love to talk about it, but this is a Dice Masters podcast. So I just got into the habit of calling her Moira X10 and uh, also calling the set House of X10. So uh, again, Strongly encourage you, if you're comically inclined, to read the House of X, Powers of Ten comic books um, and perhaps research a little bit more about Moira um, because this reincarnation ability she has as a mutant and the fact that she remembers everything she did in her previous lives is very interesting. Yeah. So. Even the art on the card at, at the comic book, at first you would think she would have multiple personalities if you didn't know her backstory, just based mm -hmm. on how the card is set up. Yeah. Um, but definitely not. So. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's uh, it's really interesting and she's a really interesting character and uh, I'm glad we decided to talk about her today, Kim. Yeah. As I said, I knew nothing about her. So. <laughs> so uh, let's move into the cards. And yep. as we mentioned, we know three rarities exist so far. Yep. Um, common, uncommon and rare that have been previously spoiled so kim do you want to give it a start yeah. so um let's start her stats first because i was sent to forget this so she's a shield character um she's affiliated with x-men so she has that on all her cards and her stats are zero zero one zero one two and a one two two so on the low end but let's see what her abilities are uh her common is a two cost um it says while moira is active Actually, this one's called It's Not a Dream. When Moira is active, when an opponent feels a continuous action die, re-roll it. If it lands on an action face, they may field it normally. Otherwise, send it to the use pile. 
So a continuous die is one that sits in the field zone. So once you field it, it it becomes used. Um, and it triggers in a variety of different effects or abilities or whatnot. It will trigger it. So um, my first thought reading this card from a current meta perspective and also um, you know, constructed, not necessarily in set, because I don't know a lot about what's in set, mm -hmm. is um, Godcatcher. Yes. So Godcatcher is a continuous action die that sits in the field zone. Mm -hmm. So if your opponent has a Godcatcher while she's active and they field it, they have to re-roll it, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if it rolls in an action phase, they can field it. But if not, it goes to the use pile. And a two cost. <laughs> Which is good so, because sometimes yeah. control cards are more expensive or harder to reach for than yes. the power cards. We've talked about that before. Mm -hmm. So the God Catcher is a three cost action die. It's a bolt. This is a two cost shield. So it's a very easy first turn purchase. Yes. The only thing you have to do with her because her stats are a little bit low is try to protect her from um, coming out of the field, right? So, yeah. So um, the one thing that I would want to talk about with this card, Kim is send it to the use pile. So we know from the rule book that anything that you do on your turn goes out of play right before it goes to the use pile. That's one of the rules in the rule book. So even though it says send it to the use pile on the card, it would go out of play unless it meets a couple of criteria. And one of those cr criteria is an un, um, unfielded character die would go to your use pile at the end of your main step. Um, now this would be a unfielded action die. Mm -hmm. So at that point, does it actually go to used or does it go to out of play when your opponent re-rolls it and it doesn't roll an action face? You would think because it says use pile that would trump anything else because it's written on the card it goes to the used yeah but it says when they field it so they're moving it from they're taking the action of moving it from the reserve pool to the field which makes me think that this would go to out of play before it goes used with that said um we would like to hear what you guys think about this so um, what I'm referencing is the X-Men Forever rulebook, um, which is the one that I always go to um, uh, about the, the card effects and all that sort of thing. So um, I'll just pull up the reference on that. I, I didn't have it handy. I'm apologizing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, what, what do you think in this case? Because you're fielding the die, then you have to re-roll it as part of the fielding action if it does not hit an action face and goes to the use pile, will it go directly to used or will it go to out of play? So I'd like to hear what the, the rules lawyers folks think of that. <laughs> I would say we're going to use pals written on the card, but, but again, there's, a, there's a rule specifically that says on your turn, which in this case, it would be on your opponent's turn. Um, here it is. So it says on page six and seven of the X-Men Forever rulebook, out of play. This is a special area that is not represented on the play mat. When you spend energy during your turn or use an action die, it goes out of play until end of turn when it is moved to the use pile. Uh, dice that are out of play cannot be interacted with. Blah, 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 blah. Um, unblocked attackers also go out of play as well as any dice sent from the field or reserve pool to the use pile during your turn. So that makes me think it would actually go out of play before it goes to used. So. Yeah, it could be. A, it's a very um, one that would need to be addressed it would, it would need to be clear it, it may need yeah. to be clarified but we're gonna i think what would have to do we'd, we'd have to take a look at um the wording here in the rule book before we go to whiz kids for a ruling so again um rules folks if you're out there let us know what you think will this card provide that action die will it your opponent's action die will it go directly to used or will it go through out of play because kim and i are of, of opposite minds here so <laughs> We'd like a yeah. we'd like a third party. 
Yeah. We'd like a yeah. third party intervention. So two cost shield. I like that. Yep. Yeah. Um, Stop rope action dice. Like you mentioned, uh, the stats are um, a little light, but we'll talk about what that with some of the other cards. And, uh, you know, I think it's a cool subtitle. It's not a dream. Yep. Because then we move into the uncommon, Kim. And what's the subtitle of that one? If it's real. <laughs> so that's a quote. Oh, okay. It's a quote from what I believe is a House of X comic book. It's not a dream if it's real. Oh, okay. So um, that's why I'm thinking this might have more to do with the House of X Moira than the Dark Phoenix Moira. Gotcha. So her uncommon is a three cost. Um, while Wolverine is active, I didn't know maybe she was associated with Wolverine, but while Wolverine is active, Moira gets plus one D. When fielded, your X-Men character dice get plus one A until end of turn. Okay, so the X-Men here is actually written out X-Men, not the symbol X-Men that usually we see on cards. So I'm assuming it's a... I'm assuming it's going by affiliation cards. Yeah, I would think so. I would think it'd be your X-Men character dice, like anything with the X-Men yeah, affiliation. But it's interesting because it's written out. In, yeah. Not really um, like uh, the symbol that usually we see on cards, right? Which um, we do see on one of her other cards. So I don't yeah. know if that's just a... A typo an, or whatnot. Ed editing miss. Yeah. Or if this perhaps is maybe a um, prototype card. And once we get the real one in our hand, it might be different. Yeah, because things can change depending on this. I don't know when we got these ones, but um, and her last sentence, because she has three sentences on this card. Um, when Moira is KO'd, prep a die from your use pile. So that's really interesting. She's got a lot of stuff going on there. So um, she does have an affiliation with Wolverine. Um, okay. I'm just trying to pull up the specifics here, but it has to do with one of her lives. Okay. Maybe she met him in one of her or um, interacted just, with him, married him, who knows? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I don't remember which life it was, but I remember yeah. Rob talking to me about it. Um, and and uh, Wolverine was, was part of one of her lives in the House of X storyline. So that's where that comes from. Um, and then, you know, she's, she's trying to help the X-Men in the House of X storyline. She's trying to help them, and she's trying to help them prevent... Uh, this big event from happening so it makes sense that she's trying to like boost them up with the mm -hmm. plus one attack when you field her your x-men character dice it doesn't say other x-men character dice so that means she herself would also get that buff yeah plus one a and that would be a static buff across the board um, and then if you're looking for something else when she's ko'd you can prep a die so in draft like she's a three cost shield with low stats only like you said one two two on the defense could be pretty easy to KO her and get that prep going. Yep. Right? Whether that's attack or block with a... S attack with her, your opponent blocks with a sidekick on level one, or your opponent attacks and you block with her or whatever, right? Easy way to, to KO her and, and get her to prep a die. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, if you're building an X-Men team, I can see where she can be useful there, this one. But I still, I'm still a fan of her, new, her first one. It's not a dream. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Last one, which is her rare. Uh, also a three cost. Uh, sorry. Subtitle is Strength of Foresight. And it has a new keyword on here, which is founder. Which we'll talk which about. Founder in a is. Yep. Um, while Moira is active, when you field an X Men character die with purchase cost of three or more, put a loyalty counter, which we'll have to talk about that too, mm -hmm. uh, on Moira. When fielded, you may send target action die from your opponent's field zone to their use pile. So again, I think really strong and constructed. And if there are continuous action dice in this set, which there may be, there's a lot of spoilers out for the set, um, then it could be effective in, in set as well. I imagine there would be. Um but again, that God catcher, right? The God catcher yep. that hasn't been triggered sitting in your opponent's action, uh, your opponent's field zone or other dice, right? It could be a great junkard die. It could be, um, you know, it could be anything. anything. 
any, <laughs> any action that can sit in the field <laughs> any action that has continuous any traps yeah. right any yeah. um any gear right mm -hmm. unattached gear if you were playing yeah, in unattached a D, &D yeah. set um, if it's attached to a, a die then that would be different but if it's unattached for some reason um like your attacker has gone through the the die the gear dice stay in the field right so if you have a shield or a sword or something like that attached so anyway it's interesting mm -hmm. so let's talk about founder first and i again we've mentioned them a lot this episode but i want to put a big call out again to chris and andy over at the ministry of dice um when this set was first announced and when they started to bring out spoilers um, they got some information about Founder and loyalty counters and they put out an article about Founder and a video about loyalty counters and we'll link those in the show notes as well. But we wanted to just sort of reference some of that information first. So let's start with um, Founder. And Founder is a new keyword and uh, my link closed. <sighs> <laughs> Just give me a second. I am like super not good today. Come on. Here we go. You know you, you put it right on there too. You could just read I it. I know. <laughs> no, it wasn't on there. The loyalty counter was. Oh, founder I was see. Oh, okay. 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 So founder is a keyword. Um, and what it does is it identifies one of the Xavier's original students from the very first lineup of the X-Men and Moira, who, as we know from what we talked about at the beginning of the episode, was sort of a silent partner in setting up Xavier's school for gifted youngsters, right? So uh, all of the characters that were spoiled at the time that Chris put this article out uh, were the original X-Men um, that had the founder on it. And founder is a, a, a keyword that creates a trigger as opposed to something specific. So if you think about um, Awaken, Awaken is a trigger, um, but every effect of Awaken is a little bit different, right? So Awaken is when you spin a die up, you use its Awaken effect. Each Awaken effect is a little bit different than another one, right? Founder is is similar. So the it creates a, a varied effect and can trigger off of other cards so there's nothing specific on moira that triggers off a of founder but because she is a founder she would trigger some of the other cards so it would actually sense? say like blah 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 your founders get blah 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 <laughs> or yeah, whatever so, so okay. here's an example the uncommon beast from this set that's coming up, which is subtitled first class, is a founder, and then he has an effect. While beast is active, when a character die with founder attacks, prep a die from your bag. Okay, so if Moira was to attack, then... Yeah. If Moira was to attack when beast was active, then that would happen. Right. Right? Or Cyclops has founder himself, but it also says while Cyclops is active, when you feel the character die with founder, deal two damage to target character die. So it, it it's it's a trigger based on what the other cards do. So it's it's not anything in and of itself. It right. works with other cards. It creates a synergy. It's like a next level affiliation. It's like a group of people <laughs> that are like a group of people that well that together work, work well yeah. together that work yeah. work off one another that type of thing yeah so um so that is is uh what founder is so like we said with moira's card her founder herself doesn't trigger specifically but if you have another card with founder that has a founder effect then um then that would that would trigger when you use Myra. Okay. Clear as mud. Clear as mud. <laughs> Excellent. Um, loyalty counters. Yes. So I would say that the nearest equivalent to a loyalty counter is the experience mechanic from D D, but it's not exactly the same. Okay. So experience is up until the most recent set, Trouble in Waterdeep adventures in Waterdeep, etc. 
experience happened when you KO'd a monster. If an adventurer KO'd a monster, um, then you would gain an experience token. And the experience token gave the character die plus 1A and plus 1D. And they just continued to stack up. Right. In the more recent set, Adventures in Troubles in Waterdeep, um, then you started to get different ways of getting experience. Like when you fielded a character die, give an experience token to this person, right? Mm -hmm. So loyalty is similar to that. Okay. So loyalty counters stay on a character card and give those dice plus one A and plus one D for each loyalty counter. But the effects and how you gain loyalty counters is not from KOing stuff. It's from other effects. So for example, in this case, when Moira's active, when you field an X-Men affiliated character die, with a purchase cost of three or more, as you mentioned, put a loyalty counter on Moira. So if you put her in the field and you start fielding other X-Men that have at least a three cost, then she's going to get loyalty counters, which means her stats are going to get bumped. So if she's on level three, she's a two, two. Let's say you field three X-Men. She becomes a five, five. Which is good for actually her other abilities. It's tougher to yeah. KO and all that stuff. Um, so that is is good depending on what you're trying to do with her because the second part was what is a when fielded effect mm -hmm. right so with when fielded you want to be able to ko her so you don't want her to be super big you want to be able to repeat the effect right yeah so when fielded you may send target action die from your opponent's field zone to their use pile i mean so she's not expensive ways, so, yeah. I mean, you could have her one active and she's gaining all these, to if you build like an X-Men team and she's gaining these loyalty counters. And then if you field another one, there's ways to KO your character. Yeah. Um, so just a wheel fielded and then you can either KO or her or whatnot. And then around yeah, she I, goes again. <laughs> I think in this set itself, is there, there's actually a, a KO mechanic, isn't it? Um dark phoenix has the the global on it dark phoenix herself yeah i'm just taking a look at her right now give me a second um it's the blue eyes white dragon global i believe oh okay pay a bolt uh, ko pay a bolt and ko one of your character dice and the next die you purchase this turn costs two less to a minimum of one three less to a minimum of one I'm yeah minimum assuming. of one yeah, I know. Yeah, They're so less. tiny. <laughs> I think it's three less. It's hard to tell. On it is three. Yeah. yeah. It, it's two or three. I can't tell either. So it's one it's of the two. two. It's Pay two. Pay a okay. bolt and KO one of your character dice. The next die you purchase this turn costs two less to a minimum of one. So you could make her super big and just pay a bolt if you had Dark Phoenix on your team to KO her. Right? Yep. So, so there are ways to KO her even if she gets big. Um, as far as stats go. Yes. Yeah. I don't actually so mind I'm, that one either. I'm really excited about this set. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are some new characters. Yes. Cool. Uh, Gambit. Love it. Hopefully, hopefully he gets a good card, you know. Um, so I guess, yeah, the good thing is that there, there's some new, there's some new characters to it, so. There's some new characters, which means we're going to get new dice. Yes. And just the fact that we're getting new dice masters to shake up um, the current meta, because we've been kind of stale with not having any product release since, you know, August or September of 2020. So mm -hmm. it's been, you know, over a year since we've had anything. Um, it's, it's exciting to have new product come out. It's exciting that it's coming out with new mechanics, um, like loyalty counters and like founder. Um, different ways to play the game and it'll be interesting to see what kind of effect those have in draft and what kind of effect they have in constructed yeah so which one do you like best Kim hmm I'm a, I'm a little bit with the common and the uh, rare yeah I if I was building an x-man team I would probably go with the rare um, mm -hmm. just to gain the effects of founder and the loyalty counters. That's if I was doing an affiliated team. But if I wasn't and then I was trying to control on a, like a meta game or whatnot or, you know, red event, whatever, um, I would probably go with the It's Not a Dream, the common. It depends yeah. what you're building for. 
I like all three of them, to be honest. Um, and I think you're right. It's exactly what it is. It depends what you're building for. I think the common and the rare may get the most play, especially in sort of constructed because of the effect on continuous action dice and how we know um, how prevalent Godcatcher is currently. Because uh, there isn't a great way to stop it. Yeah. But I really like the uncommon for draft. I think the 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 um, synergy that they've set up between Wolverine and Moira, right? When Wolverine's active, Moira gets extra defense is really cool. Um, that you can field her to buff up your X-Men with plus one attack. And because she's just a three cost, it's really easy to get her for cheap and you can just, you know, spam them. She's got a max three. That's something to call out, though, is that she's max three. Yes. On all of her versions. Um, but then also from the prepping perspective, because in draft it can be challenging sometimes to get your dice and hard to prep. So the fact that you can KO her and prep a die from your from your use pile, mm -hmm. right? That's really cool. You're prepping a die from the use pile, which means you get to pick any die in your use pile. Like maybe a seven cost Dark Phoenix. Or a 12 cost <laughs> Supreme Intelligence. Right. <laughs> Everybody buys that card. <laughs> well, it's got a way to get, make it cheaper. I think it has to do with loyalty counters. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so any die in your use pile, you get to prep when she's KO'd. Mm -hmm. Whatever you want. Yeah, it really, I think she can go with any kind of team you're building, really. Yeah, so I think all three of these are really good. I think all of them have their place. And I'm really excited to try all of them out when we get Moira in hand in early 2022. Yep. Yay. <laughs> New product. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's maybe wrap Moira up there, Kim. Wrap her up. So let us know what you think of Moira. Which Moira is the Moira that you would want to play with first? Are you a common, uncommon, or rare Moira uh, character to, to play with? What's the one that, that calls out to you? What do you think about the common? Will the die go out of play or to the use pile? Your opponent's action die if it does not roll an action face. Um, so are you team Super K? It goes to the use pile. Or team <laughs> Jostich? It goes out of play. So let us know what you think. Um, we would love to hear your thoughts on Moira. We'd love to hear where you think uh, the Moiras are going to go and if you think that they're going to be meta useful. So let us know. And you can let us know by reaching out to us in a bunch of different ways. So you can send us an email at triple D podcast at DM dashnork.com. That's where WizKids told us the Dark Phoenix Saga was coming. <laughs> you can leave us a comment on our YouTube version of the podcast, uh, which is at youtube.com forward slash DM North TV. You can find us on Discord. Kim is at SuperK and I am at Jostitch. That's J-O-C-E Stitch. You can leave a comment on a couple of different places. There's our episode post on dm-north.com. There is all of our Facebook posts on facebook.com where we are known as DM North TV. Uh, and we post on our main page as well as on the DM Unlimited, um, DM Unlimited Facebook page. You can head over to Reddit because we usually post it over there too. Um, you can send it to, I lost my train of thought, uh, Twitter and Instagram, DM North TV. You can leave posts there. <laughs> uh, and you can follow us on Twitch at twitch.tv forward slash DM North TV. Kim and I would like to take a moment to thank everyone for listening to us for a second year. Our two year anniversary is coming up in February. And we're really excited to hit that milestone. We've had a great year of 2021, despite the fact that we haven't really had any product that's released, and we hope that you have as well. We're really looking forward to 2022 and wish all of you and your families and your friends and your Dice Masters playing pals all the best for 2022. So until next time, on a double double and dice. <laughs>